We gather this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us keep now a moment of silent prayer as we open our hearts and our lives to the God of all grace and mercy. Let's pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Jesus Christ, by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to God and the This is a feast of victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Let's pray. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, boys and girls. It's nice to have you with us this morning. I want you to think of someone you know who is younger than you. Maybe you have a little brother or sister or uh, maybe somebody you know from a, a neighbor, a cousin, uh, but somebody you know who's smaller than you. And I want you to think about the things that you know that they don't. Right? Maybe you know... Um, shapes and colors or numbers or letters uh, maybe you can read and they can't yet right think of all of the things that we know and remember that once upon a time you were that little too and didn't know all of those things 
I mean, that's kind of how life is, isn't it? As we get older, uh, we learn more things, we understand more things. That's part of the fun of growing up, is that we become more aware and more knowledgeable about how life is and how the world is, and we get better at so many things. And that's hopefully what you look forward to. And every day we go to school or uh, just in the things in life, we learn more stuff, and, and that's how we grow. And, and, of course, you can see that. You can see that your parents, your teachers, right, they all know all kinds of stuff that you don't know. Yet, someday you will know all of those things too. And you know what? You will know more. Because not only do we all, each of us, learn more things as we get older. The whole world learns more stuff every day. New stuff is being discovered. New things are being learned. And, and that helps all of us get smarter and better. And that's a great thing, an important thing, that we should never reach the point when we think we know everything because, you know what? We never know everything. I mean, God made us so that we would always be curious and always want to learn and always want to understand. And that's why it's really important that we should all work hard all of the time, no matter how old we are, to learn and grow and understand new things. Tomorrow is a kind of a holiday in this country, and it's kind of a weird holiday because we've been learning in the last years, last decades, the whole world has been learning to understand this day in very different ways. We used to call it Columbus Day. Some parts of the country still do, some do not. We also often call it Indigenous Peoples Day. That's a great big word. That means people who have always lived in this place and not people who came here from another country. And we've come to understand that it's much more complicated to think about how we all came to be here. And that changes the way that we think about one another. That's something that we are all still learning and trying to understand better. But the more that we learn, the more that we grow, the better we are at living together, the better people that we are. And it's really important for us to be curious about things and people that we don't know and understand yet. So you be curious. When you say things you don't know about, you ask. Ask somebody what that is. Ask the question, why? Because why is a really, really important question. And promise that every day you will try to grow and learn about something new. And I promise you will grow up to be a better and happier person. So thank you for again for being with us today. There are children's bulletins uh, available on the church website. And at 9.30, starting at 9.30, you can also access the Sunday School lesson via video uh, on our Facebook page and website too. You have a really great day. The first reading is from the prophet Isaiah. O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plan formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong people will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from their rainstorm, and a shade from their heat. When the blast of the roofless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dark place, you subdued the heat with the sh shade of clouds. The song of the roofless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord host will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples. The sheet that is spread over all nations, he will shallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. And the disgrace of his people will take away from the, all the earth, and the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, lo, this is, your, is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. 
This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. We will read responsibly Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading is from the letter to the Philippines. Philippians. I urge Judea and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind of the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, Help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, again I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by power and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel this morning from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Once more, Jesus taught them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite anyone you find into the wedding banquet. The slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's pray. 
Good and gracious, Father, you gather us all into your heavenly banquet. You invite us by your grace to come. But you, you call us to be prepared. You call us to be ready lest we missed, miss this important gift. Grant, O oh Lord, that we might have the faith to know the true path of discipleship, that we might see and know your abundant gifts every single day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have been watching this um, really fascinating documentary um, uh, on something called Nexium. Uh, you, you know it's weird just by the way it's spelled. It's all capital letters, N-X-I-V-M. Uh, anyway, it's a corporation, and it's actually been in existence now for kind of a while, and it uh, sort of started as... Um, this this kind of training program it's meant to be a, uh, a, a sort of a coaching kind of thing and it conducts these seminars they're called executives it's called the executive success program and and people can come to it and and they can grow their skills and it's designed obviously to help people uh, get more out of their life it's it's not your standard you know go to the ramada inn for a couple hours seminar and learn a couple management tools it's much more complicated than that uh, and in fact, they call their training sessions intensives. And if, if I have this right, you, they were like 12 hour long days and it would be several days on end. I mean, it was really extensive. And, and you didn't just go to one, but you would go to series of them. And, and uh, every time you went to one, you would progress in this uh, sort of overall program. And they had these sort of uh, color coded scarves that you could get as you made your way up the ladder in, in this program. Uh, and and uh, but it turns out that there was something also else going on. And, uh, part of the attraction to it, I think, was that it wasn't just about learning skills or uh, um, sort of tools that you could use. It was really uh, this very personalized uh, sort of program. And so you you learned about your own weaknesses or your fears, and and you found ways to kind of overcome them. And it was very much as much about personal development as it was about anything else. And it attracted thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people who paid pretty high fees to come and be a part of this program and came from all over the world. And it really uh, quite a, a going concern. But it was a cult. Uh, at the same time, it was a cult. It was disguised as this management program, but it turns out it was uh, something much more sinister underneath it. Part of where it really became obvious that there was something going on is there was sort of a group within the group. There was this other program that was specifically designed for women. And it was to help women sort of also maximize their potential, but it turns out that, that, there, it, that there was all kinds of awful stuff going on. And, and the women who were invited to take part in this sort of upper level program uh, were asked to give uh, personal secrets to somebody. They were to call themselves slaves and they were assigned masters and they had to give over this material, this sort of uh, uh, blackmail material to these people who were their masters and then um, they were branded. They were quite literally branded uh, with what turned out to be the initials of the man who was running this whole operation who a little over a year ago now was uh, put in jail uh, for uh, sex trafficking and uh, racketeering charges, among other things. Um, there is still a group of people uh, who are supporters of him and, and supporters of this program uh, who are still fighting through the legal system somehow to set him free despite all of this awful stuff. But what really drew it to me, I mean, I've always been kind of fascinated with cults. I, I, I'm fascinated by how people get ensnared in them I, I'm fascinated by, by what attracts people, obviously, especially to religious cults and, and how the teaching of the faith can go so far off the tracks that it becomes, you know, another Jonestown or uh, another Waco, and, and those seem to be happening just sort of constantly. But what really fascinated me about this one uh, was that it was different, that it's different, and that it's not poor people. I mean, usually people who are attracted to cults are in some way dislocated or disenfranchised from the world, and they're kind of lost, and they get drawn into these cycles of these very charismatic leaders because they have nothing else in their life. Not true in, in this case. These were 
highly educated, often professional people. Uh, just a few weeks ago, another one of the leaders was placed in jail. Uh, she was the heir to the Seagram fortune. So here's a person of, of substance and means who also got drawn into this very strange, odd, offshoot sect, call it what you want, but in this very wrong way of living, got drawn into the orbit of this very charismatic leader and, and lost her way. I think that's important for us to always be thinking about. The uh, other Old Testament reading, the one we didn't read that could have been assigned for today is uh, Moses coming down off the mountain in the story of the Exodus to discover that the people had created this golden calf Right, and they were dancing around it and worshiping it. And I always think of that as kind of the first cult moment in, in maybe in the history of humanity. Um, that you know, and it, it it fascinates me, right? I mean, here we are, this group of former slaves who have seen these incredible acts, who have seen their God take down the greatest empire in history at that time, and set them free, done the unimaginable for them. And here they are not very far past that event and they've already given up on that God and, and taken the wrong path. Right? The, the, there's this restlessness uh, about us as human beings. This inability to, to accept the path that we've been given and this constant desire to make a way of our own. And, and in that process, we always get lost. We always stray from what we were created to be and to do and what we've been called to be and to do. And so in Isaiah, in this uh, really wonderful hymn of praise, we get this really fascinating kind of line here where Isaiah talks about God having these plans formed of old, faithful and sure. And it's the prophet's way of reminding the people that God has always had a path for them. There has always been a right answer. And I, I think that's part of the conversation. We do tend to think that there are a lot of right answers. And, and so here you get this sense that, it, that, that this way is sure, it's certain, it's obvious. Except that word sure is much more complicated than that. It's really actually a terrible translation of the Hebrew there. Because what that word really means is true. That, that God has had plans, these old plans, that were faithful and true. That is, they were right. That there is a right way and a wrong way. And, and of course, we always want to do right ways and wrong ways and very specific things within kind of our reach. And in the process, we miss out completely on the right way. A, a big thing, a great thing. Not a lot of details about how you should live, not found in all of the little intricacies of the Torah about how we should dress or how we should watch our, wash our hands or what foods we should eat or not. But this overarching vision that God gives us of his kingdom that is present and obvious throughout the entire word of God. And lest we miss it, Isaiah places it for us really clearly very obviously, that there are two things that are, God is to be praised for. One is that the cities, by which Isaiah want, means to represent the powers of this world, of wealth and status and security and might and violence, all will be torn down, all will be destroyed. That God's way is the end of worldly power and worldly aspiration and worldly kingdom. And in its place, God will provide a refuge for the poor and for the lonely. And this is God's justice. This is the vision uh, of God's kingdom. This is the way. This is not the only time in all of Isaiah that we run across this idea. We see it. Dozens and dozens and dozens of times and not the only time in the Bible. We see it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And, and, and here it is, clearly set forward. God has brought us to this place where we might experience his truth. That worldly power shall be no more. And that we shall be about the business of justice, of caring 
for those least among us, those who are in most need. And then Isaiah gives us a great vision uh, of a celebration, of a feast on a mountain where everything is perfect and wonderful and all are happy. A place where we, in fact, celebrate not what we have accomplished, but that we have been faithful to what is true, that God has taken away from us our shroud, all the things that weigh us down, that God has wiped away the tears from our eyes, tears caused by this constant battle for us to make the way be ours, and instead given us clear wines and rich foods and all of the beauty of his presence. If we will just go in the right way, if we will just know what is true. That is the challenge of faith. But that is the gift of God's word. We are so lost. And it seems so obvious to us right now. And I found myself really drawn this week to these words of St. Paul that he writes to the Philippians. And he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Paul says, think about those things. And I wanted to ask myself, what is it that we have been spending most of our time now thinking about? How easy is it for us, in fact, to get caught up thinking in exactly the opposite kind of terms? Thinking about what is hard and what is painful and what is sorrowful and, and what is violent and what is angry and what is corrupt and what is greedy. What's great about this, this word that Paul writes to the Philippians is, is this word think is not just about this sort of mental process. It, it is the same word that he uses in Romans when he's talking about Abraham. And Paul talks about Abraham's faithfulness, that God had made this promise to Abraham, and Abraham just grabbed onto that promise and took it. And Paul says, it, God reckoned that faith that Abraham had as righteousness. In other words, Abraham took God's word for things, and God said, that's it, that's good. You're righteous because you took my word for it. I will see you in this particular way. That's the word that Paul uses here. I, it is about how we see the world. Whether we see the world somehow as not enough for us. Whether we are constantly caught up in this need to find more, to make more. Whether we're always trying to build the kingdom of our own. Whether we're always dissatisfied with what we have and what we, on, what, what we want. Whether we are constantly creatures of our own lust. And Paul says to the Philippians, Think about good things. Consider what's possible in the world, what is right, what is true, what is just, what is wise. And, and, and see God in those terms, not in the terms of all the things that are broken and, and all of the things that are making our lives hard now, but think in terms of of what's good and reckon the world in that way. Imagine, imagine if we could all for just a moment see not what was hard and real about the world, see not just the failures and the shortcomings, see not just the brokenness and the awful way we treat one another, but imagine if we could see ourselves in a place that was good, in a place that was right, I imagine if we could see the end of all of the, the powers of this world. Imagine if we could see a world where those who are needy were cared for. Imagine if we could see ourselves being about the business of God's justice. Imagine if we could see that day. That vision I is our salvation now. Where we have all become so down trodden because of what we have lost and all that has gone wrong. God grants us this gift of grace, this greater vision of his kingdom, this other way to be. And instead of 
destroying ourselves and our world by dancing around the golden idols that we have cast, now God calls us to stop and to reflect, to pause and to breathe, to have hope and to have joy, and to remember that all of these things that Paul talks about, justice and pleasure and things that are commendable and things that are worthy, all of that is there for the taking. All of that is on the way. All of that is part of God's teaching. And as we apply ourselves to those, then we will join God in this great feast on the mountain where we will, we will exult in his joy and praise his name forever. May we recommit ourselves to the teachings of our God that we may live in his presence and joy forever. In Jesus' name, amen.
with the whole church now let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, for those in need, and for all of God's creation. Heavenly Father, we have strayed. We have lost our way. We have sought after idols and ideas that are not you, that are not right, that are not good for us, that have caused pain and destruction and division in our world. We pray, Lord, that you would open us up to the truth of our own works and that you would set us free from the powers of this world that keep us captive. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Father, show us what is good, what is right, what is commendable, what is just, what is worthy. Help us, O oh Lord, to think on these things. Help us, O oh Lord, to align ourselves and our world with those things. Help us, O oh Lord, to know you are those things. And grant that, O oh Lord, that that vision of your kingdom, of a life and a world of grace would save us, would give us peace and comfort and hope in these difficult days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we lift up to you so many of our neighbors who are in need. And we remember those who are troubled by storms, those who are recovering from hurricanes, those who are waiting for the next those who are living in the midst of fires and every kind of trouble. We pray, Lord, for those who are fighting in the midst of this pandemic, for nurses and doctors and all of those who place their lives on the line every day for us. We pray for all who worry and live in fear. We ask, Lord, that you would set us free from all of these troubles. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Father, we remember our friends and neighbors who are in need this day. And we pray for those who are sick and those who are hospitalized and those who are recovering from surgery and those who are fighting against disease. And we pray, O oh Lord, for those who grieve this day, for so many who have suffered loss, that the promise of the coming feast would, would lighten their loads. We ask, Lord, now that you would look upon all who we name before you out loud and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All of these prayers, O oh Lord, we cast upon you because of the grace of and the mercy that you have always shown us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This would be the moment in the service, of course, where we would invite you to share uh, your gifts, your offering, uh, your financial gifts in support of this ministry and in support of the Church of Jesus Christ. We invite you again to consider the importance of giving uh, in your own faith life, in your own discipleship. And if we can be of any assistance to you in that process, uh, please do reach out to us.
this great feast that Isaiah envisions begins for us here at this table where we come for just a taste, just a, a, a bit that will give us a sense of a connection to what lies ahead for us. And as we gather at this table, so Jesus comes and sits with us too, that we might share his presence, and having been fed, that we might find ourselves again living out the promise of his discipleship. And so we remember our Lord Jesus Christ and how on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread from the table and he gave thanks to God and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this, he said, remember me. And then again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to them to drink. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, he said now, and remember me. And so we pray together in the way he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we will receive the communion. If you have picked up the elements from the church, I invite you to take those now. Uh, if not, if you have just bread and wine or juice that you brought from home, that will be fine too. But for now, uh, take the part that has the bread in it. Carefully open it up. Receive the bread with these words. This is the body of Christ given for you. And then the wine. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place nourished and forgiven into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst. Guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you with mercy and grace. May the Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.
Again, thank you for joining us uh, this morning for worship. I uh, want to remind you uh, again uh, of our ongoing programs, Complins, uh, morning devotions every day, Thursday Bible study. Uh, we have added some uh, faith formation programs now for young people. There is a video Sunday school lesson for uh, grade school age and younger children uh, that is available on the Facebook page and websites at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. Uh, there is a Wednesday night Zoom gathering for middle and high school youth with Luke Compton, uh, and that link is also available on the email uh, and on uh, the Facebook page. So please take advantage of those. I invite your young children to do that as well. Uh, please be careful. We know that cases are continuing to rise, starting to rise again now around us, uh, that things are dangerous. So please uh, do your very best to keep yourself safe. And if you do need anything, please know that we are here to help in any way that we can. In the meantime, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.